Hi, welcome to Boarding Fundamentals, BF5, Understanding and Working with Young People. When we talk about young people, it's a term that we use for adolescents, teenagers, youth, but we tend to use the term young people these days. It's that time of life between childhood and adulthood, generally 14 to 25 years old. United Nations defines youth as 15 to 25. This transition time from childhood into young person, youth, adolescence can be age related, starting at age 13, or it can be related to a physical marker such as the onset of puberty or menstruation for girls. Puberty is that time in life when a child becomes sexually mature, usually 10 to 14 for girls and 12 to 16 for boys. And this varies across different cultures. We know that it is occurring earlier and it does occur earlier for girls and boys. And it's um, caused by social and nutritional factors. There is a link between very early puberty, particularly for girls, and mental health conditions such as anxiety and depression. So we need to be on the lookout for that. This time, which is between childhood and adulthood, adolescence and teenagers, the concept didn't exist before the 1940s. And we believe this came about through television marketing, that they wanted to market to this group of people. And so it became a separate group, not a child, not an adult, but a separate group and a separate culture. When we look at youth characteristics, you've got fast physical development, uh, young people are forming an identity, there's increasing independence, there's emotional maturing, there's a restructuring of the brain, and there's this preparation for adulthood. So they are the sort of things we see in characteristics of youth or young people. Let's look at the generations. And when we talk about gener generations, we're talking about generalizations about a particular time period and the people who were in that time period. The silent generation, 1925 to 1942, this is my parents' generation. I'm not sure why they're called the silent generation, but they are. Then we had the baby boomers, and I'm a baby boomer. Generation X, 1965 to 1980. Generation Y, 1981 to 1996. Generation Z, 1997 to 2012, and then we've got Generation Alpha, uh, 2012 onwards. And these are the young people who are just coming into boarding now. So what do we know about Generation Alpha? We know that they're constantly connected to technology. They're reliant on technology to discover the world. There's an increasing tolerance and acceptance of diversity, increasing awareness of climate change and sustainability. There's some challenges, potential increased social isolation because of this reliance on technology and, and being connected and being by themselves while they're doing that. Higher risks of depression, anxiety and loneliness. There's lots of similarities between Generation Z and Generation Alpha. There's this blurred kind of crossover, um, this high connection to technology, the many platforms, apps and media. The most in-demand job is a software engineer. Many of these young people have got both parents working and most of these will probably earn less than their parents. And that's interesting. But apparently that's because of the uncertain nature of work and the way that work has changed. Um, there's less reliability, less long-term work for young people. Next, we want to look at developmental stages. And this, the stages that apply to us really are early childhood, five to eight years, middle childhood, nine to 11 years, early adolescence, 12 to 18, middle adolescence, 15 to 18, and early adult, 19 to 40. What we know is that age is not a predictor of maturity. So some young people are older, but they're not as socially mature. Most follow a predictable order, although ages can vary enormously, and young people develop at different rates in different areas. And so the question is, what stage are your students? Appendix 4 has got the developmental stages and characteristics of those stages. And it's things like this, characteristics like that they're concerned about physical development, looks like being liked by their friends, keen interest in their bodies, sex, etc., changing hormones, mood swings, they desire independence, yet they want and need their parents' help. It's all of those sort of things 
that are characteristics of these developmental stages. It's interesting um, and it's worth having a look at. Young people all need to belong. They need to be accepted by their family, peers, authority. They need to experience success, and that's important for their self-esteem. They need to have increasing independence. They need to contribute, to give, give out, to give back. They need to develop their own identity, including their sexual identity, and they need to experience adventure. So in a boarding context, to meet all needs, you provide a choice of activities or level of difficulty in your recreation program. Some young people may need more experiences to catch up to others in some areas because there's so much variation. 5.4, the adolescent brain. There's lots of growth and development. Unused neural pathways are pruned away and necessary and important pathways are strengthened. The prefrontal cortex, the part where the rational thinking happens, is last to mature and you can see that this is problematic. Teens process in information with their emotional part, the amygdala, and as they mature, they can reason better, develop more control over impulses and make better judgments. When overwhelmed by emotions, they can't think because they are just feeling. So that's the adolescent brain. 5.6, Australia's young people. Australian young people aged 15 to 24 make up 11.82% of the population. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander young people aged 15 to 24 are 4.9% of Australian young people. In 2021, in the census, young people reported that the top three issues in Australia for them were COVID-19, 45.7%, the environment, 38%, equity and discrimination, 35.4%. The majority of young people, 51.6%, felt either very positive or positive about the future, which is great. Issues of personal concern were coping with stress, 46%, mental health, 42%, school or study problems, 36, 37%, and body image, 33, 34%. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander young people, their top three issues was COVID-19, 42%, equity and discrimination, 32%, mental health, 29%. When looking at work and study in this group, age 15 to 24, 81% of young people are fully engaged in work or study, 10% are partially engaged and 10% have no study or employment. Study age 15 to 19, 85% are enrolled in study and it break down, breaks down like this. Tertiary study, 18%, vet courses, 7.2%, school study, 29%, apprenticeships, 2.3%. Study age 20 to 24, 45% are enrolled in study, 35% in tertiary education and 8.1% in vet courses. Young people felt barriers to study and work were mental health barriers, 51.5%, that's very high. Academic ability, 42%. COVID-19, 32%. The effect of COVID. In 2019, 92% of young people aged 15 to 24 were studying or working. In March 2020, unemployment rate of young people peaked at 16.4%. Between March and May 2020, a total of 843,730 jobs were lost and almost 330,000 of these jobs were held by young people. So young people were 14% of the total employment, but 39% of the job losses. So it was a really big hit on um, employment opportunities for young people. Between June and September 2021, 2,081,000 2 jobs were lost. 55%, more than half of these, were held by young people. As the economy recovered, there were new jobs for young people. 97% were casual or part-time with little job security. And that's why we talk about the likelihood of young people, this generation today, Generation Alpha, earning less than their parents because of this casual part-time job pattern with little job security. 
Let's look at the health of young people. The top 10 burden of disease issues in males 15 to 24 are suicide or self-inflicted injuries, alcohol use disorders, depressive disorders, motor vehicle accidents, asthma, anxiety disorders, back pain, drug use disorders, acne, autism spectrum disorders. So when we're talking about burden of disease, we're talking about the total cost to the community in terms of people not being available, the actual financial cost, etc. The burden of disease, the top 10 for females, is anxiety disorders, depressive disorders, eating disorders, asthma, suicide and self-inflicted injuries, back pain, bipolar affective disorder, polycystic ovarian syndrome, alcohol use disorders and acne. So that's females and that was males. You can see the difference there. Um, many young people are overweight or obese. One in four, 27% um, of 15 to 17 year olds were either overweight or obese. So this is higher than 1995 when it was um, 20%, but in 2007, 2008, it was 30%. So, you know, there's been a bit of a change there. Alcohol and drugs. 30% of young people aged 20, 14 to 24 drank alcohol at levels that put them at risk of harm at least once a month. 24% of young people aged 14 to 24 engaged in illicit use of drugs, including pharmaceuticals. In this group, daily smokers were 6.8%. So that's um, the the 14 to 25 year olds, occasional smokers 4.2%, had never smoked 85%. Stress, 44.5% of young people felt stressed either all the time or most of the time in the past four weeks. So stress is an issue and mental health is also an issue. Long-term mental or behavioural conditions were 26% of Australian young people, higher amongst females, 30% than males, 21%. The most common conditions are anxiety, 17%, and depression, 12%. Disability, 9% identified as living with disability. Most common in order are autism, attention deficit hyperactive disorder, ADHD, learning disability, physical disability, anxiety disorders. So let's look now at the social lives of young people, the sexual activity. By 16 to 17 years old, one in three had engaged in sexual intercourse. By 16 to 17 year old, 49% of females and 31% of males had experienced some form of unwanted sexual behaviors in the past 12 months. And that's pretty concerning, of course. Treatment of young people, more than one third, that's 34.2%, reported that they had been treated unfairly in the past year. And these were the reasons that they gave for being treated unfairly. Gender, 37%, mental health, 27%, race, cultural background, 27%, sexuality, 21%, age, 18%, religion, 11%, disability, 7%, and financial background, 7%. Looking at young people and technology, how they embrace technology, um, email 99%, web browsing 99%, watching video 98%, accessing news 93%, banking 92% and shopping 90% um, used by young people to access the internet, mobile 97%, laptop 82 and tablet 51. So it's mostly mobiles, mobile phones. Smartphones. So social networking sites, this is monthly active users in Australia. Now this is not necessarily young people, but it's going to reflect the same for young people. So you've got um, at the top of that group, you've still got um, 18 million monthly active Australian users. And secondly, you've got YouTube. Now, if you're looking at this from the perspective of young people, those two could be reversed. YouTube is probably likely to be more popular than Facebook. Then you've got WhatsApp, Instagram, LinkedIn, Snapchat, uh, WordPress, Twitter, Tinder, Tumblr, and Delicious, whatever that is. 
So looking at crime, youth aged 10 to 24 were 33% of all criminal offenders um, and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children were 25, 25 times more likely to be in detention than non-Indigenous children. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander young people 15 times more likely to be in prison than non-Indigenous young people. So they're very sad statistics. 5.7 Youth Culture Australian youth culture is very diverse and varies greatly depending on age, geographic location, ethnicity, socio-economic background and individual differences. Common characteristics and trends with Australian youth culture include social media, environmentalism, mental health, diversity and inclusivity and entertainment. So let's just unpack those a bit. Social media. Like many youth cultures around the world, social media plays a significant role in the lives of Australian young people. Platforms like Instagram, TikTok, Snapchat are popular for sharing content and staying in contact with friends. Environmentalism. Australian youth are increasingly concerned about environmental issues such as climate change and pollution. They are active in environmental movements and they advocate for sustainable practices and policies. Mental health. Mental health is an important topic amongst Australian young people and there is a growing awareness and support for mental health initiatives. Diversity and inclusivity. Australian young people are diverse and inclusive and they embrace and celebrate differences in race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation and religion. They are vocal about social justice issues and they advocate for equality and human rights. And entertainment. Australian uh, young people are into various forms of entertainment, including music, movies and video games. They also enjoy outdoor activities such as sport, hiking and beach culture. So, overall, Australian youth culture is very diverse, it's socially conscious and it's digitally connected. We all need to keep in touch with current youth culture and the characteristics. And why is that? It's because we need to do this so we can have empathy and connection with young people today, that we can be relevant to young people today so that we know what interests and engages them. And we need to know it for a duty of care so that we can be more alert to the issues and so that we are more able to support people, young people more effectively. But just to note that young residential supervisors might be quite close to the age of the students, so they need to watch the boundary gap to make sure they observe the boundaries. Older residential supervisors need to understand and try to bridge that age culture gap. 5.8 Subcultures. A subculture is a social group with patterns of behaviour that distinguish it from others in the culture or society. So youth subcultures are different to youth culture. Subcultures are based in fashion, beliefs, slang, dialects, behaviour, vehicles such as cars, motorcycles, scooters or skateboards, music genres, punks, ravers, metalheads, socio-economic class, gender, intelligence, ethnic background and some subcultures have been around for a long time, even decades. Here's a list of typical subcultures, um, emo, Super geek, jock, dolly, gangster, punk life, glamazon, hipster, techno, boho and techno, bobo, lads, surfies or waxies, skaters, hall girls is a more recent um, internet based subculture, sea uh, punks and gym bros. And then we have e-boy and e-girl subcultures. These have emerged from the online world on social media platforms like TikTok and Instagram. They have distinctive fashion styles and aesthetics, and it's a use of technology and social media that makes them different. Overall, the e-boy and the e-girl subcultures represent a new wave of youth culture that's heavily influenced by social media and technology. So this is a new wave. They're characterised by their distinct fashion styles, their love of alternative music and the online communities. Then we also have 
uh, subcultures like Ishe, which is a male urban youth subculture, dude, bro, homie, subspecies of bogan, lots of branded clothes, drugs, smoking, and getting into fights. Um, and so that's Ishe. So what should our approach be to young people in subcultures? Probably with this one, to discourage it. <laughs> but generally, if young people are in a subculture, we should take an interest, ask them about it, hear their story, engage with them. Just take an interest. Respect their right to individuality. They chose this for some reason. So um, respect their right to that. But you have to intervene if their choices are harmful to them or other young people, or if they break the residence rules. So that's subcultures. 5.9, young people as the focus, or we call this youth-centered practice, where young people are our main focus um, and, and we engage and provide opportunities for young people where we you know, intentionally empower young people. So we wanna look at youth-centered practices and applying youth-centered practices, and there's a lot of these. Um, so here we go. Understanding factors that influence young people, being sensitive to special needs, respecting identities, culture and diversity, understanding developmental issues, knowing about issues and interests, being aware of rights and responsibilities, include young people in decision making, empower young people, and this is very important, um, being careful about confidentiality and duty of care, making sure we observe the boundaries, having a comfortable, user-friendly environment, using a sensitive approach to dealing with its issues. So these are youth-centered practices. Our practice needs to be fair and inclusive. Young people should be treated in a fair and inclusive manner, made aware of their rights and responsibilities, encouraged to respect and understand the views of others. Any barriers to accessing any part of the service to boarding should be identified for vulnerable young people and strategies for inclusion should be part of the residents' access and equity policy. Diversity. We should acknowledge and celebrate diversity and difference. Staff should receive appropriate training and take action to prevent discrimination. Residents' culture should promote positive appreciation of equity, equality, social justice and diversity in society. Inclusion is all people having, all young people having a fair and equal access to the benefits and programs in the residence. Inclusion should be effective and well planned. Some possible barriers that may prevent a young person accessing all of your services, your boarding services, um, Privacy concerns, like a fear of being noticed, shame, shyness, stigma, lack of confidence, a disability or health condition, bullying or peer pressure, racism or discrimination, language barrier, lack of literacy, staff attitudes, money, religion or cultural restrictions, dependence on technology or dependence on substances. 510 in effective interaction. So we want our interaction to be caring and positive. We want it to be non-judgmental. We want it to be fair and inclusive. And we want to have rapport, a genuine interest where we connect and listen to young people. So listening to young people, our own journey, our own personal journey affects how well we listen and our reactions to what we hear. So um, our values, our opinions, our biases, our weaknesses, our strengths, all of that's our journey and that affects how well we listen. So we need to self-reflect and this helps us understand who we are, how that affects us and how we can stay non-judgmental. So when we self-reflect, we're asking what are my values, what do I feel strongly for, what do I feel strongly against, what are my biases and weaknesses? What are my triggers? And so we, we self-reflect so that we can better listen to young people and to do that non-judgmentally. Another part of this is empathetic listening. 
just paying attention to the emotions of young people and trying to walk in their experience or in their shoes. When we're looking at effective listening, we need to make sure that we give young people our undivided attention, that we're not looking at our phone at the same time as we're listening to them, that we are non-judgmental, that we're quiet, young people don't need an instant reply, that we respond to their emotions as well as what they're saying, make sure we understand, and so sometimes you'll have to ask them to clarify, that we are approachable and that we do not overreact. Then we have communication to build trust. Firstly, we should keep confidentiality. Now, there are exceptions to this, and that's when um, uh, a young person tells us something and we have to report it because we are a mandatory reporter or where our organisation requires us to report something. So make sure you keep your word and never lie to a young person. There are going to be times when you have to admit your mistakes and apologise to a young person and you share your experiences in a limited way. And so we do this in a way where we can help young people understand that we've been down this road before, but we're not sharing our intimate personal experiences with them. And then we want to look at rapport, 5.12 rapport, and this is a very important part of boarding practice. Just getting the balance in rapport. We do not want to be distant or uncaring and neither do we want to be overly informal or over familiar. So we need to have that balance with rapport where we're engaging with young people um, and we're, we're not distant or uncaring, we're not over familiar or informal. We've got that balance right. Rapport is that friendly connection where we've got that common interest, but we're maintaining that distance, that professional gap. Being over familiar is being excessively friendly, informal or intimate or taking undue liberties. And if you are over familiar, a young person may lose respect, not follow instructions, may take liberties, become dependent on you make accusations because this does look like grooming and may expect special treatment you know which because it looks like favoritism so how do we restore the balance we don't punish young people it's not their fault um, uh, it's our fault and so we have to admit to them you know you might say something to them look I've been a bit too free and easy I'm going to have to make some changes and then you reinforce that professional distance between you for a period of time. And so um, you might actually go in the opposite direction. So rather than uh, being too informal, you might be more formal and more distant until you can come back to that correct balance. So that's restoring the balance with rapport. 513, cross-cultural youth. Cross-cultural issues, students might experience language barriers, expectations that are hard to understand, discrimination, past trauma, dislocation, disconnection, negative economic and health outcomes, and poor access to health services. So students might experience any of that. So how do we support culturally and linguistically different young people? Firstly, we value diversity we use cross-cultural brokers. Now, a cross-cultural broker is a person who can walk in both worlds, in the other culture and in your culture. So, uh, for example, if we're looking at a young person from a Aboriginal background or an Aboriginal context, that might be an Aboriginal youth worker who's a cross-cultural broker, or it might be a non-Aboriginal person who's worked in communities and understands communities and is able to bridge those cultures. So that's a cross-cultural broker. We need awareness training for staff and students. And when discrimination does happen, we need to be able to deal with it straight away. There's some good YouTube videos around about celebrating um, cultural diversity. This one here is an Australian post celebrating cultural diversity in football. Um, and there are others as well. There's playing for change, 
Don't Worry, Be Happy, Stand By Me. Um, and there's another one called What Kind of Asian Are You? And you can see some of them here. Um, oops, I'm going to play a little tiny bit of this one. I'm hoping you can hear that. Um, and this one here, What Kind of Asian Are You? This really brings out... Uh, um, how this young person who's approaching this lady, how improper his questions are. Hi there. Hi. So if you get the nice opportunity, day, huh? have a look at yeah, these finally, on right? YouTube. Where are you from? And better your still, if you can show these Diego, to young people in your residence, then that can help them um, understand <clears throat> and uh, discuss cultural difference. Wrong. Um, and well, I was um, born in help Orange them County, to be but I never actually uh, culturally there. appropriate. 514 Intervention. So when must we intervene? We intervene for risk-taking behaviour, that's any risky behaviour or behaviour that could be harmful, self-harm or suicidal thinking or suicidal action, disrespectful or bullying behaviour, breaking the rules. We intervene so that there's safety and care for the students. We intervene to change behaviours and to achieve positive outcomes for young people. 515 choices and goals. This is a time in their lives when young people are making a lot of choices. We should know, um, they should know what the options are, make the choices known to young people, discuss options, discuss consequences of wrong choices, model strategies for good choices, help collect information, help understand rights, and work with young people to develop their own goals. And this empowers young people. We need to discuss consent with young people. It's good to show them the cup of tea YouTube video because I think that explains it very well and helps just people to just understand all the different parts of consent. So discuss this and make sure that young people know what this means. 516 is a community development approach. So community development is a process Members are supported to identify and take collective action on issues which are important to them, empowering community members and creating stronger and more connected communities. Community development is a holistic approach based on the principles of empowerment, human rights, inclusion, social justice, self-determination and collective action. Community development considers that the community members themselves are experts in their own lives and communities. And uh, community development values community knowledge and wisdom. Community development is led by community members at every stage, deciding on issues, selecting and implementing actions and evaluation. It has an explicit focus on the redistribution of power to address causes of inequality and disadvantage. In community development, there's a wide range of activities. So it could be building relationships between community members, organisations and institutions. It could be identifying community needs. Community members identify their needs and develop strategies to address their needs. It could be building capacity, the skills and capacities of individuals and groups in order to promote sustainable development and self-reliance. So it's all of those sort of things. And it's also facilitating social change by promoting social justice, equality and human rights, mobilising resources, including financial, human and physical resources, advocating for change at the local, regional and national level. In the boarding context, the community is the boarding residents and the community members are boarding students and boarding staff. And Community development in this context seeks to empower students and staff to lead and develop programs that will benefit the boarding communities. And that's within the parameters of the residence structure, the code of conduct, the residence policies and procedures, um, appropriate behaviours, etc. And the outcomes should be an increase in skills, knowledge and empowerment and self-efficacy, which is a belief in their ability to complete a task or achieve a goal. It should achieve more social inclusion and connectedness. 515 Power Imbalance. 
this is where one person has more power than another and where that imbalance can impact the life of a person with less power. This can come from status like popularity, size, one might, person might be very big, uh, could be family, sporting success, wealth, age, confidence, gender, time in the group. It might be your position in boarding. So you might have very senior students and young students. You might have boarding supervisors and students. And there's this power imbalance. One has more power than the other. So how do we deal with this? Recognize that it occurs, understand why, understand the effects of the power imbalance. Um, is it having a negative effect? need to make sure that it does not impact the lives or the quality of boarding life for the boarders. Create empathy, try and understand how that feels for the other person and just monitor this power imbalance as you move forward. So that's power imbalances. 516 is reflecting on our practice. So this is trying to look at our practice and reflect on it and understand whether our practice is good, whether it could be better, whether there are issues with our practice, um, but just reflecting on our practice. And this is good practice to do this. Reflective practice is the capacity to think back on our actions, decide if our actions were okay or not, and then change your practice if you need to. Our bias or our backgrounds or our opinions can negatively affect our practice, our conduct, our reactions, our reflection, and we need to find out if that is occurring. And we do that by seeing other people's reactions, complaints, etc. It's good to ask for feedback, you know, from either a mentor or a head of boarding. Um, you'll have an appraisal process, and hopefully in that you can find out about your practice there. You can reflect on your practice and just to self-reflect. And it's always good to do this after an event. So you might have had, say, an altercation in boarding last night. And after the altercation, it's good to sit down and just reflect on what happened. Could you have avoided it? Um, how did you handle it? Would you have handled it differently? And then you can make some decisions and change the way you do it in the future. And then in your assessment, you'll see this self-awareness questionnaire. And so the self-awareness questionnaire looks like that. And if you can complete that self-awareness questionnaire and also say what you do well in and the sort of things where you need to probably change or where you need to work on something. So that's the end of Boarding Fundamentals BF5. I'd ask you to please to complete the assessment BF5 and send it into admin as soon as possible. Thank you very much. Bye.